Pictized K1 is the K2B's larger cousin, but size isn't the only difference. With M.2 support and SSD support, lower power draw, and all-around solid performance, the K1 might be the ideal board for your next project. Welcome back to Mackie Tech, everyone. And a while back, I reviewed the K2B and was rather impressed with some of its performance. And it got me wondering, how does the K1 compare? On paper, it's just as robust in raw CPU power, but it brings a few tricks that K2B does not. So today we're going to see where it stacks up, where it falls short, and where it might actually be a better choice and smarter setup for you. And speaking of smart setups, today's sponsor, Brilliant, is perfect if you're like me and love tinkering, buffering problems, or diving deeper into how things work. And with thousands of visual interactive lessons, Brilliant trains you to think more clearly, logically, and creatively. And as you explore topics like data analysis, algorithms, and physics, you'll learn by doing and by developing both confidence and mastery through step-by-step -step problem solving. Brilliant builds a rock-solid foundation and then guides you through progressively more challenging problems to deepen your understanding. Brilliant makes it easy to sharpen your programming skills every day with hands-on courses in math, science, programming, data, and AI. You'll start with the fundamentals, then build up to more advanced challenges all at your own pace. Whether you're diving into a new subject or just squeezing in a quick lesson, the app's intuitive design helps you stay engaged and make meaningful progress. So head on over to brilliant.org forward slash MackieTech, scan the QR code on the screen, or click the link in the description to start learning for free with Brilliant. As a bonus, Brilliant is giving our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, so you can dive into everything they offer every single day. And a huge thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get back to the K1 board. And if you're new here, make sure you click that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future videos. Kickpie sent the K1 board for free, but they're not revealing or approving this video before it goes live. And everything you're going to hear are my opinions only. So as I mentioned, the K1 is much larger than the K2B, measuring 144 millimeters by 80 millimeters compared to the K2B's 81 millimeters by 55 millimeters, which is more in line with the Raspberry Pi dimension. The unit I've been working with has two gigabytes RAM, 32 gigabytes of onboard eMMC storage powered by a quad-core Cortex A55 lock chip processor. It's also available with four gigabytes or eight gigabytes of RAM and eMMC storage options of eight gigabytes or 16 gigabytes. Out of the box, it ships with Android 13, which is fine as a starting point, but if you wanted a more traditional desktop feel, you might want to go with Pixpie's Debian 11, which is what I'm going to be using, or Ubuntu 20.04 for a GNOME desktop. Now the K1 is primarily marketed as a development board for AI, IoT, or industrial use cases. It's not really a consumer-ready out-of-the-box device, and it doesn't come with an AC adapter. In fact, I couldn't find any real clear reference on their website to which adapter you would need until I reached out to PicPi directly, and they informed me it wasn't included because most developers would already have one, but they did send me an Amazon link with a correct 12 volt barrel jack power supply that I'll leave in the description, and it runs about 10 bucks. One of the very unique features of this board is its onboard support for SATA SSDs M.2, and it gives you two ways to hook up a display, what's called EDP, which is great for larger, high-resolution laptop-style panels, and MIPI DSI, which is better suited for smaller, low-power touchscreen displays, as one might find in tablets or handheld devices. You also have two USB, 40 GPIO pins, two one gigabit ethernet ports, another MIPI interface for a camera, and you have a USB-C for flashing the eMMC. Speaking of the USB port, you'll need to use it to flash an OS image to the board's eMMC because as far as I can tell, the board won't boot from a micro SD card. Additionally, the documentation for flashing the onboard eMMC is a little rough and you'll need to install some additional utilities from the PicPi in order to do so. 
So with W11 now running on the K1, I put it through a series of tests to see how it stacks up against the K2B. So let's take a look. The K1 CPU temp at idle was similar to the K2B at 33 degrees C, and during the Sysbench tests, it neared about 35 degrees C, which is similar to the K2B. For the Sysbench tests, running all four threads, we got 14,827 events, or around 1,482 events per second, and for the single thread, 3,797 events, or roughly 379 events per second for the K1. I also ran some storage transfer speed tests, and for the SSD connected via the onboard SATA port, we got roughly 438 megabytes per second. And with the eMMC storage, we got 165 megabits per second, which is about a comfortable average for both the SSD and the eMMC. See. For comparison, the KickPi K2B Sysbench hit 1192 events per second for the four threads test compared to the KickPi's 1482. So, why are the K1 Sysbench scores better than the K2B's if the K2B is supposed to be a more robust board? And it's because the K1 is using the Cortex A5 chip, which is newer than the A53 on the K2B and therefore it's more efficient and crunches numbers faster and it does usually perform better on tests like the Sysbench. And keep in mind that doesn't mean the K1 outperforms the K2B across the board, pun intended. Uh, the K2B still wins in heavier, you know, real world tests like video transcoding and decoding and multitasking, which we'll discuss shortly. As an example of multitasking, if you're like me and obsessively keep lots of Chrome tabs open, work in GIMP on large images, or run Docker containers alongside everything else, the K2B clearly has the edge. Its Cortex A53 cores handle more simultaneous workloads without slowing down, and the K2B can do it, but it'll hit limits much faster. With respect to running Docker and self-hosted apps, or even setting up a 24-7 media server, both boards can do the job, but the K1 shines for light to medium stacks like Home Assistant, small web servers, or Plex and Jellythin. Its M.2 and SSD ports plus its low power draw make it super efficient for always on use. And speaking of Plex, the K2B is probably the better option thanks to its extra CPU efficiency and stronger video engine. The K1 can handle light transcoding, but it's simply not built for heavy workloads. That's most evident with YouTube playback where the K1 just drops frames like crazy as we're watching the big buck bunny here even at lower resolutions at 720 because it lacks full hardware decoding support for YouTube codec. And last but not least, that leaves us with which one is better for your budget. On Amazon, the only K1 I found had 2GB of RAM and 32GB of eMMC storage and was listed at 53 while on AliExpress it was listed for 97 which is weird. While the K2B with 2GB RAM and 8GB of the MMC was 26 on Amazon but the same board was 46 and went up to almost 80 if you double the RAM on AliExpress. As mentioned you'll still need to purchase power adapters regardless of which board you want but I'll leave a link in the description for both. So if you want a low power budget friendly board for media serving or docker use, go with the K1. If you need more raw power for heavy multitasking transcoding, the K2B is probably the better choice. Anyway, that's going to wrap up this video for today. If you found it helpful, please make sure to leave a comment or give me a thumbs up both of which I really do appreciate and they always help me out. Also, if you haven't done so already, please make sure you click on the subscribe button and hit the bell so you are alerted when I release new videos. Thank you again for your continued support and giving me a watch and we'll talk to you again very soon.